Hello friends, it is turn 11 and we have successfully taken both of our targeted provinces, losing in one of them all of our wolf raiders and in the other all of our spearmen. But that's okay, that's what they're for. The important thing is that we're starting to get a little bit caught up on, on expansion. It's also a random event with some bonus gold, that's nice. So there's a few things I want to talk about this turn and the first is that I just want to go over my orders. We're continuing to expand. I'm going to try and crack this province. This might not be enough troops to take it, but you never know. And if we fail, well, it was going to take three turns to get this army somewhere useful anyway, so it's not like it makes much of a difference in the long run. This army is heading north. As I predicted, uh, this province has been taken by someone else, so we don't have that convenient corridor, uh, and we don't have the convenient locking off of this, this throne province, so we might try and take that relatively early, except it is actually, it's ruled by a an AI pretender, so we need to be careful about that. Throne provinces tend to be protected by huge armies, and the more important the throne, the more likely it is that it has an AI pretender sitting in there. They don't take part as a nation in the game, but they just protect the throne. So we'll head north up here to cut this off, and then it might be tempting to try and take this province as well. I'd rather have taken this one. I suspect that Ermal's going to push up there. On the other hand, it's a barbarian province, um, and this is probably not enough troops to take it, actually. So the question is, who's sitting in here? And will they be taking this barbarian province? Anyway, my goal with this is that I'm going to take this province and then try and take this province before Uruk manages to try manages to march in there. To that end, I'm actually recruiting some mercenaries in this province so that they can move in as well. That's because lizard provinces are deceptively difficult. There's often not very many troops in them, so they're quite easy to defeat. But the real problem is that they're usually ruled by one or more lizard shamans. This is to our advantage because, you know, lizard shamans can be recruited in that province and they're very useful, cheap mages. But the downside is that they have this nasty habit of just spamming cursing spells during the, the combat to take the province, which doesn't really do anything during the combat, but is a permanent debuff on your troops that just sits there and makes them more likely to get uh, afflictions in combat. So if your commanders get cursed or key troops get cursed, that can be a huge pain. So having an extra, you know, 20 crossbowmen in the battle to soak up a few curses might be quite useful. We've got these guys marching into here. Hopefully they'll be able to take that. I mean, they can take the, they can take Bear Tribe easily. The question is whether or not someone else is pushing into that province this turn as well. And finally, over here, I'm going to wait one more turn's worth of recruitment of wolf riders before I try and sneak this province. If this province is already taken by then, that's not the end of the world. You know, a team of wolf riders can be quite useful elsewhere. And unlike my Jotuns, they can travel fast enough that they can get to places in time to be relevant. So the other two things I wanted to talk about were the other nations that we've now come into contact with and diplomacy, because I have received some diplomatic overtures. Generally speaking, in Dominions, diplomacy is uh, honour-based and, you know, reputation in a player community based. Most of the communities that I've seen, and all of the ones I've played in, have a general rule that trades of materiel for materiel are binding. So if you're trading magic gems, gold, or magic items, and you are receiving magic gems, gold, or items, that's binding. You have to do that. If you if you fail to make good on your end of the deal, that is actually a breach of the of the community rules. However, all other forms of diplomacy, including trading materiel for, for example, territory or allegiances or paying someone else to go to war with someone else, that's all based on a, on a reputation-based honour system. It is not against the rules of the game for you to break those agreements. And people tend to honour those agreements for most of the game, although in the end stages of a game, when people are doing that, trying to you know, scrabble over the last handful of thrones on the map. That's when people start breaking non-aggression treaties and so on. I have established a couple of non-aggression pacts. I have a pact with... Pangaea, which is a non-aggression three pact. There's a sort of um, a semi-formalized system that's arisen out of the community where uh, this is an open-ended pact. So we have a non-aggression pact forever until until one or both of us decide to dissolve it. And three means that there is a three-turn window between dissolving the pact and it being okay to attack the other person. With Marignan, he approached me and offered a uh, five-turn non-aggression pact, which is, you know, basically the same thing. We won't attack, we agree not to attack each other, uh, but rather than it being open-ended, it lasts five turns specifically. That's quite a short amount of time for a non-aggression pact. Most people prefer open-ended pacts, so I'm slightly suspicious of him because of that. I've also received a request for a non-aggression pact from Nabar, which is weird because I don't have any contact with Nabar. I don't know where in the world they are even. Presumably they're to my northeast or northwest or north, depending on whether Uruk is to my north or my northeast. Presumably his scouts have reached me, but mine haven't reached him. All right, all of that established. Let's have a quick little roundup of the nations that we have encountered. Pangaea, as I mentioned previously, are themed around ancient Greek wilderness mythology. So it's all, you know, satyrs and, and minotaurs and that kind of thing. 
Marignan are medieval French themed. They have um, castles and knights and knightly valour and all of that kind of chivalric nonsense. Got a strong focus on cavalry. To the south, we have Pelagia. They are themed around, they're like fishmen and stuff. There's a few different takes on different kinds of fishmen. Some of the nations in the game are based around like actual historical mythologies of fish people, tritons and so on. And some are explicitly modern fantasy, such as the nation of Relay, which is literally Relay from the Cthulhu mythos. To the east, or possibly southeast, we have Ermor, who are themed around the Roman Empire and death magic. So they have a lot of legionaries, and they have a very powerful ability to summon undead on their priests. They don't have to cut. They don't have to use gems to cast death spells to summon undead. Their priests can just conjure the dead out of a province, which means that they're actually a huge threat, and they tend to get coalitioned early in the game to be wiped out because they are so dangerous. If that doesn't happen, they tend to snowball with infinite undead. No idea who's to the east, unless it is these guys, which it probably isn't, because otherwise they'd have taken this province already, I think. And then to the north, or possibly northeast, we have Uruk. Uruk were a nation that used to exist only in the early era, and then were just not present for the middle and late era games. But they've uh, they recently had a middle era, uh, middle era version of their nation added, which is interesting, because the theme of Uruk is the oldest humanity. I believe they are Ur in the early era, and the, the idea is that it's literally the first human city in existence, and the people of that city, who are sort of like semi-cavemen, semi-giant guys. They have a lot of stuff themed around ancient Mesopotamian mythology. They are the Enkidu. They have these weird half dragon thingies. There's a lot of there's a lot of cool stuff, but they're um, potentially a problem because since they are a, a half giant nation, they are actually tough enough to threaten our troops. Which means that we have fishmen who we can't fight because they're underwater. We have uh, Pangaea and. Marignon, both of whom have powerful sacred cavalry that we don't want to tangle with. To the east, we've got one of the most powerful nations in the game, which is usually banned in most multiplayer matches. And then to the north, we've got a giant nation who are similarly giant-like to ourselves. And if I'm right about this being the capital province of Ashdod, we've got another giant nation to the east, so we don't actually have any easy targets. It would be really convenient if we had a nation that we could just fuck up and eat in the early game, but um, apparently that won't be the case. Also, as a side note, in terms of expansion, I'm a bit disappointed with how I've gone. We've got We've got 13 provinces, which is all right for expansion. As I understand it, the received wisdom in this game is that you must have at least 12 provinces by turn 12 as the absolute bare minimum to be viable in a game. If you fail to to get at least 12 provinces by turn 12, there's basically no coming back from that. You'll just get snapped up by someone else and devoured and defeated in the early game. So we are ahead of that, but not by much. It's turn 11 or we're at 13. But we are rapidly running out of space to expand into. It'll be uh, a few turns of snapping up the last two provinces and formalising borders with my various neighbours. And then it will be an issue of, do we pick someone to go to war with, or do we focus on building up our infrastructure first? Anyway, that's quite enough from me. That's going to be all from this turn. Wait, no, it's not, because I forgot that my scouts have actually moved far enough that we've run into someone else. This is Ulm. Ulm's a fun nation. They're actually kind of anti-magic. All of their troops are human troops, and they have very little access to magic. They have they have strong earth mages. They have they have basic access to earth mages and a little bit of fire and a teeny tiny bit of astral and air. Very rarely, there's something like a ten percent chance any given one of their spellcasters will have access to either one of those. My second ever game was actually playing as Ulm, and that game's still ongoing. I'm actually on track to win it potentially. So they're a cool nation, but um. Yeah, they're themed around they're themed around medieval Germany and also a sort of a Conan the Barbarian esque riddle of steel kind of situation where they they worship metal and stuff. Anyway, that's gonna be all for this turn. Hello, friends. It is turn twelve, and it is time for more of this. This is pretty much the last bit of expansion we'll be doing. So let's have a quick check. Successful with no losses. That's nice. Successful with fairly heavy losses, which isn't surprising because knights hit really hard. I wonder if there was a friendly fire death here. Because, of course, this game has friendly fire. It has every single mechanic you can imagine and every single granular detail you can imagine. But these guys killed six and we lost seven, so there must have been something. We also, unfortunately, had what is called a bump with Uruk, which is, I think I talked about this previously, when you both try and move into a neutral province at the same time. We took care of the independence and then a much larger army from Uruk marched in afterwards and smashed us. Normally a bump is not grounds for warfare, uh, you can talk that, talk that kind of stuff out in diplomacy, however I have received no message from Uruk and I am the last person to update their turn today, which means he's intentionally chosen not to talk to me about anything. This is a, this is a very, very strong expansion army. These things cost like 100 gold each, or 200, 200 gold. They're incredibly expensive and he's committed two of them to his expansion army. They can basically take a province by themselves. 
So this battle we are going to take a quick look at because I want to know what his bless is. So we just need to wait for his priests to bless. There we go. Now we can check a sacred unit and what do we have? So it looks like his bless has been customized to provide an attack boost and then mostly just defenses. Shock resistance, poison resistance, fire resistance and larger, which is interesting. These, uh, these giants are size 3 by default, which is the smallest size of giant, but that means his sacred troops are going to be size 4, which is as big as my own giants. They're also very strong to begin with. We don't really need to watch the rest of this, I'll just put it on high speed so that we can see my guys get absolutely wrecked. This is pretty bad because due to, you know, time constraints, I was using a, a mage to expand with and she's just going to get wrecked. <laughs> there she goes. So that is an unfortunate waste of a mage. Now, I could approach... Aruk and talk to them and be like, so, you know, how shall we, how shall we arrange this? You know, if you let me have one of these three provinces, I won't go to war with you over them. Or even just let this border stand and arrange a non-aggression treaty. But I don't, I don't like that he didn't message me. I don't like that they haven't contacted me at all, despite killing one of my armies. In addition, I've secured pacts with most of my neighbors, so I don't really have any other avenue for expansion. Traveling diagonally is pretty difficult, so I'm not going to be pushing into Ermore and Actually, this is Scalaria. Scalaria and Ermor are very similar. There's law reasons why one branched off from the other. Um, but I don't want to be fighting them anyway. This guy I have a non-aggression pact with. This guy I have a non-aggression pact with. This guy I had a non-aggression pact with, but it was a limited five-turn pact. I'm currently trying to negotiate a second open-ended non-aggression pact. And um, yeah, so really, if I have to push somewhere, it might as well be to the north. They're not an ideal matchup for me, but but I reckon I can I can cause them some troubles. Especially with skeleton spam, which they really hate to deal with. It's also interesting to note in that battle, it looked like they had taken a bunch of curses, which probably means that they took a Lizardman province somewhere in their territory. The one other thing to mention is that we've finally taken that incredibly valuable province, which is worth way more than I thought it would be. And then the moment we've taken it, we've had a random event. So these I don't believe these events are triggered by anything. They're just one of the random events that can randomly happen at random. This one is, a, is essentially the step one of a two-step Event chain, step one, warning that there'll be an attack. Step two, independence will attack that province. And if they win, it will reset back an independent province. Although this is being attacked by barbarians rather than the native knights, which is interesting. So I'm leaving this army here this turn. I would send him somewhere more useful, but if we're going to lose this incredibly valuable province next turn, if we don't do that, because barbarians will just wreck the province defenses. I'm also summoning some cheap mercenaries into this province just to bulk out the forces against the barbarians. So we should be able to retain this province, which is useful. That's probably going to be the site of our second fort as well. As you can see, it is a large-sized farmland province with river access, all of which will boost its income, which is why it's got 221. As you can see, our income is currently giving us, what is that? That's about 1,300 gold to spend every turn. But that's not where we'll put the first fort. The first fort is going to go in here. This is going to be a useful defensive bulwark to the west, since I don't know if Marignan is going to be chill or not. Strategically, it would be more sensible to put it here, since that's the only direct connection. These rivers block travel this way. However, my dominion spreads cold, which will make these rivers crossable. I would much rather retain this very valuable large-sized province rather than defend this less valuable ordinary-sized province. Normally this would still be worth protecting because it's farmland, but since it's cross-type farmland and mountains, they cancel each other out. And it's basically just the same as a plains. The other reason, of course, is that later on I'd like to take this throne province and put a fort in it to defend the throne, and I'd rather not have my forts be adjacent to one another, so that, so that they can actually draw some extra resources. In terms of orders, that's most of the important news that we have. I forgot to mention this last time, but I'm moving my first ever Vetihag out of this province over to here to build a second lab over here. It's much, much better for me to spend mage turns on my Veti Hags doing things that aren't research or, you know, item crafting, simply because the Veti Hags, they're just such worse wizards. You know, it doesn't matter how good a wizard you are, if you're building a lab, everybody's equally good at that task. So why not have the garbage guys do it? Which leaves one other thing, which is that this turn I'm going to start site searching. I actually forgot that blood sites are incredibly rare, so I've wasted a mage turn on this wizard bringing her from the capital to do site searching. I'm not going to actually skip that and not have her do it. But we should get plenty of income from these two as they as they march around in uh, nature and uh, death and a little bit of astral. So I'm just going to move them in a clockwise pattern through my territory, site searching as they go. If I had enough wizards, it would be good to send out a second party, but I really don't. I need everybody else to be researching. In a couple more turns, we'll be able to do skeleton spam, 
which means I might start switching recruitment in my capital from these, which I can get one every turn, to these, which I can get one every two turns. This would give me access to another another type of magic, and also would give me some turbo communion tactics, which I'll talk about later when they're more relevant. But yeah, for now, that's everything. Right then, it's turn turn 13, probably? I should probably start writing down what turn it is, because I can never remember properly. We've re discovered zero magical sites, which sucks. We've successfully conquered the Lizardman province, which is good, although we will need to check our troops and see who's gotten cursed. We have the predicted barbarian invasion event happen in Whiteport, but we've also had another invasion happen, and this one had no warning. We also had another negative event, but uh, my geeky-ass wizards have... Um, a fortune telling ability, which means that they can have a ch small chance of preventing bad events. I was correct to leave my, my troops behind. As you can see, they've pretty easily defeated the barbarian horde that was attacking. But frustratingly, the mercenaries I had summoned to uh, eat up the barbarian charge did not in fact appear. Someone else outbid me on them, which is irritating because I bid like 10 extra gold. These won't be bad to, these won't be difficult to defeat. The question is whether I can get to this province before someone else snaps it up. Lemuria might... Uh, try and sneak this province away from me, and if they do that, I will be very salty about it. So, what's the plan for this turn? Well, we're doing a few things. I'm looping these guys back over here for reasons. I'm also sending out more scouts. I have started to build a lab in this province so that we can start recruiting more Veti hags there. I've also recruited a couple of independent commanders. These are going to be useful for assorted things. You can only get your good commanders in your forts, and we only have one fort at the moment, and I need it to be producing wizards, which is why I had a wizard uh, commanding troops a few turns ago. So it's a common practice to recruit independent commanders to do stuff like build forts and so on, because you don't have more important people whose time you want to waste with it. Which is, I believe, why I recruited this commander, even though I actually have someone building in here already. So this commander is going to go here to build a fort, and there's a few other coming in as well. Recruiting independent commanders is also useful for ferrying troops around. You don't want your, you know, expansion army to have to call, come all the way back to your capital to pick up troops and then head all the way back out again, because that takes forever. So if you have a bunch of spare independent commanders sitting around, they can they can pick up troops and move them around much more easily, which is convenient, especially if they're cavalry who can move quite fast. Speaking of, I just want to point out that these guys are so fast they can move across three of my provinces in one turn. Or, yeah, see? They can step all the way to a third province in one turn. They can't do that through enemy territory, however, being able to do that within my own territory is very useful because it means I can, for example, maintain a large force of these guys to put down rebellions, or have them jump around to patrol uh, wherever they're needed to reduce unrest in a province. Site searches into another site to search for sites in another province, because that's what site searches do, they search for sites. I might also have, a, have one of these guys start blood hunting soon. Unlike all of the rest of Magic Gems, you harvest blood directly out of your populace, which is another reason why it would be good to have an unrest group moving around. Other than that, there's not much to say. I'm sending a scout to ping this throne and see how tough it is, because if we can grab that early, that might be quite useful. On the other hand, it might be a undead throne, which is bad. <laughs> so what the scout will do is he'll move into this province to attack it, start the battle, and then immediately retreat. There's a 75% chance for them to retreat to it, and if that fails, there is then an additional chance for them to retreat to safety because it randomly picks an adjacent province. So apart from that and my continuing uh, troop recruitment happening in a few different places, there's not much to say. Oh, actually, I should mention, when we conquered this province, it happened to have two already revealed magic sites. This is defined by the type of site. There are just certain sites that are always visible, regardless of whether you've searched for them. So this one produces extra resources and extra gold, which is going to be very useful when we put a fortress here, because that means this will suck extra resources in and I can recruit more troops there. Relatively soon, I'm going to be switching from producing Gigas in my capital to producing Skrati, which are the werewolf guys who are also powerful spellcasters. This is going to enable me to do something called a turbo communion more efficiently. And I've mentioned communions and turbo communions a few times, so it's time to finally explain what those are. Communions are a mechanic in the game where spellcasters can combine their strength in order to cast more powerful spells or to share the fatigue. Communions are necessary for a lot of high-end battlefield spells, and there's a few different ways they work. The two most common are Astral Communions and Blood Communions. The way that Astral Communions work is that there's just a, a low-level Astral spell you cast, which allows a spellcaster to declare themselves as either as a master or a slave in the communion relationship. Communion masters have their spellcasting abilities boosted by one level in every path they have, based on how many communion slaves are under their command. A master with two communion slaves gains a plus one bonus to all of their path levels. With four slaves, it's plus two. With eight slaves, it's plus three, and so on. 
Nations that have access to cheap astral spellcasters tend to use a lot of low-level astral spellcasters for the for this purpose to fuel big communions, but there's a lot of different ways you can make it work. The alternative is the Blood Sabbath, which works in exactly the same way, except it's a blood spell which costs one blood slave. And an interesting side note of the way that communions work is that the communion is just kind of like a battlefield pool. It doesn't matter how you get into the communion network, once you're in there, you're in there. Which means that you could, for example, have someone use Blood Sabbath to declare themselves a communion master, and other people use communion slave spell to declare themselves to be communion slaves, and it will still work. There is a third way to get into communions, which is to use song magic, which only a couple of nations have access to. The Arthurian-themed nation of man have access to song magic, and also a couple of the Irish mythology-themed nations have it as well. But that's not really going to be relevant to us. So the benefit of a communion isn't just that it increases your spellcasting levels. The other benefit is that a communion master doesn't suffer fatigue. The fatigue is shared equally amongst all of, uh, amongst all of their communion slaves. This is the only way to effectively spam powerful battlefield spells, and in order to actually get our skeleton spam tactic working, we'll need to use communions. This brings me to the turbo communion tactic. So one way to make a communion work is to have a lot of very cheap communion slaves, so that a large amount of fatigue is shared widely between a huge amount of guys, so that they all only gain a tiny amount of fatigue. Another alternative is to take advantage of a couple of different mechanics. So when you hit 100 fatigue, you fall asleep. And if you continue taking fatigue, you'll eventually hit 200 fatigue. At 200 fatigue, you start taking physical damage instead of fatigue damage. What this means is that if you have someone with a big health pool and regeneration, you can essentially use them as a big blood battery to fuel a communion uh, much more efficiently than having a large number of individual uh, communion minions. And Jotunheim is one of the better nations for this because we have access to those scratty mages. These guys can actually cast, you know, Blood Sabbath on themselves to make themselves into communion slaves. When they are in werewolf form, they have a native 10% health regeneration. They also have about 60 hit points, which means that they would be regaining 6 hit points per turn. However, if you have a Gigias in command of that, which we will be doing for death, death magic purposes, the fact that they have one nature magic means they also have access to the personal regeneration spell. And this is where it gets interesting. Because another side effect of communions is that any personally targeted spell cast by the communion master also affects all of their communion slaves. Normally, every spellcaster has, has to cast these spells on themselves. The only way to have it ha affect multiple units is to use this technique. Which means that if you have a Gigia with two Scrati as her communion slaves, she will be casting death spells at death level three, and she will also essentially have an inexhaustible source of fatigue in order to cast spells with, because... The thing about regeneration is that it stacks. So those Scrati will be regenerating 12 hit points per turn, and the Gigia can just completely freely cast as many spells as she likes for the entire combat, while these two giant werewolves just take a nap on the back lines. This gives me an incredibly effective tactic and is a really good way to fuel um, skeleton spam. And even before we get that set up, we can actually make this effect work to a lesser extent just by using our Gigias, because with a cast of personal regeneration, they'll be regaining three hit points per turn. You know, which isn't tons, but it's enough. So the, the, those communions would be less efficient, but they would still be functional as turbo communions. This tactic's going to be really useful when we go to war with Uruk to the north, because basically nobody likes skeleton spam. That said, there are some downsides to skeleton spam, such as if you go up against a nation with good, um, with good priest support, they're able to banish the undead fairly easily but it's a really effective tactic to use in a wide variety of situations. And we also have various other things we can do with those communions. We don't need to only make skeleton spamming death communions. If we use it to fuel astral magic on our rare astral spellcasters, or even to fuel nature magic to summon tons of additional troops in combat, or any of the other many, many things you can do. So a bit of a long explanation this time, but that's going to be all from me for this turn. Thank you for being cool, I guess. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Ko-fi or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.